What's up, everybody? Thralls Metal here once again. I'm Necrog Nick, and we are at part two of my top 40 best albums of 2023. We're going to go through 25 through 11 here, and then the next batch obviously will be the top 10. I don't really have a big preamble for this one since I already gushed about how awesome of a year in terms of music that 2023 was. So I'm just going to get right down to it with number 25. Evangelic Zool. This band has been lurking in the underground of Italian brutal death metal for years, which that scene is absolutely rabid, ferocious. It is fast paced and it is honestly, I think, one of the heaviest scenes out there as far as brutal death metal. I know Indonesia is like crazy right now with that shit, but Italy's got some absolutely nasty bands and Evangelic has always been in those circles, but I think this might be their strongest album yet. Not only is it just absolutely savage and brutal, packed with blast beats, giant breakdowns, and just massive riffs, this band is really taking a shine to, I would say, Niles' style. There's a lot more atmosphere to this, more melody squeezed in, more dynamics in general, but it still packs an absolutely brutal punch across the board. And since we didn't get a Nile album this year, this actually kind of worked as a nice replacement since, well, we get an Nile album next year. The drum work is absolutely insane. You have just rapid fire, double bass work, and crazy turnovers. The riff work is intricate as hell, very technical, but it doesn't get so technical where it just comes across as wankery. And again, the atmosphere just makes this so much more grand, like Worship of the Black Flames, Hymn of Savage Cannibalism, and there's a couple on here with words that I just don't really know how to pronounce, like Udug Hul incantation. I got the last one right. I may not be able to say all these tracks, but I know that I liked all these tracks. This was an absolutely punishing listen from start to finish. If you're a big Nile fan, especially uh, Annihilation of the Wicked, like that album in particular, definitely check this out. This was an absolutely fantastic release. At number 24, we have Unearth, The Wretched, The Ruinous. This was uh, kind of a surprise release for me. It isn't as though On Earth has just like disappeared. They've been constantly putting out like pretty solid, straightforward metalcore for years. But there was something about this album that it just felt like they just captured everything that they're about on one album and did it to almost perfection. This is the first one that they have done without Ken Susie as their second guitarist. He actually departed fairly recently to go join As They Lay Dying because he wanted to make a horrible career move, I guess. But that put Buzz McGrath center stage in here, and the guitar work on here, I think, is some of their best since Three in the Eyes of Fire, which I hold that album in high esteem. This album is just packed with intense, anthemic, biting, heavy songs across the board. This album just flat out reminded me why I still love this band. They actually got to play here in Toledo not too long ago, and they put on an absolutely incredible set. Not only does this album pack a brutal punch with the hefty breakdowns that are all over here, there are absolutely incredible melodies and harmonies and leads all over here. Again, Buzz really outdid himself in the guitar work. Trevor sounds like he is growling to the point his voice is giving out. Songs like Cremation of the Living, Dawn of the Militant, possibly my favorite track on here just because it's one of the heaviest songs I think they've ever written. And of course the Oppenheimer samples seem to fit so damn well right now. But you also have like great melodies on songs like Mother Betrayal and the absolutely awesome closer Theater of War. This album kind of reminded me why I became a fan of metalcore in the early to mid 2000s. Like that was totally my jam. And yeah, I kind of fell off the wagon in terms of like being a big fan of that style. But when it's done well, you know it, you feel it. And that is 100% this. Absolutely love this album. Number 24 on my list. If you have not checked out this one, strongly recommend it. If you're an old school metalcore fan, who knows? It might uh, rekindle a love for that style again. Check it out. At number 23, we have Spirit Adrift, Ghost at the Gallows. This album, I feel like, is just a love letter to all things classically heavy. Very much a retro heavy metal act. They pretty much have evolved from like kind of a doom metal, heavy metal hybrid to just flat out awesome heavy metal, but with like giant hefty guitars across the board. There's still a little bit of the doom that kind of pops up in their sound, but overall, this just kind of goes for these big, heavy metal anthems with big hooky choruses, 
loads of guitar harmonies. Like, man, is this album catchy. You have big anthemic rockers like Barn Burner and Death Won't Stop Me, but you also have like some more like somber, reflective songs bordering on balladry, but it doesn't come across cheesy. In fact, it comes across very earnest and heartfelt. And I love that about this album. Like, it, again, feels like a big love letter to all the early heavy metal and hard rock that just heavily influenced a lot of the music that I listen to. Like, you get notes of, like, Thin Lizzy on here, as well as, like, Dio and Iron Maiden. All things that I still love today and all things that were very important to me in terms of, like, getting into heavier music when I was younger. I don't know if this is their best album yet, but I'll be honest, I don't think they have a bad album. They are grossly consistent, and I've liked this steady sort of evolution of their sound, moving from doom metal to classic heavy metal. The transition has been very seamless just because they like to blend the two very often. And here lately within the last two albums, I feel like they've just fully embraced everything very classic 80s and late 70s about heavy metal and hard rock. In terms of capturing that sound, I think this band just flat out nailed it once again. This is an absolutely killer album. Again, Hard to say whether or not it's my favorite one by them, but it is yet another absolute banger in their discography. If you have not checked this out for whatever reason, I strongly recommend it, of course, because I strongly recommend all of these because they're all my favorites. But if you're an old head and you just want to hear great riffs, great guitar harmonies, killer catchy choruses, check this out. Trust me. At number 22, we have Willhaven 7. This one definitely came out of left field for me because I really hadn't listened to this band very much since, oh god, probably their second album. But I heard a lot of hype about this album, and when the week came up that this was released, it was like, you know what, let's check this out. And man, is this one of the heaviest, darkest albums I think I listened to that isn't necessarily purely metal. While I would say there's a lot of like sludge metal influence to this, there is a sort of like heavy Deftones helmet, like that sort of like nondescript, like is it metal or is it hardcore? Doesn't matter because it's absolutely awesome. You have just these lurching, disgusting, bending riffs all over here. Grady's vocals sound like he's just ripping his throat raw and just spraying blood and viscera everywhere with every single scream on here. And they only add to the sonic heaviness of this with the droning synths in the background. Like, this is almost like a hardcore version of a Neurosis album in ways. There's a constant drone of atmosphere in the background behind these constantly chugging, bending, disgusting riffs and heavy syncopated grooves. While I like them at their more savage, you know, songs like Five of Fire and Diabolito, I think are just absolutely disgustingly heavy. It's when they get more melodic that it feels even heavier at times. Pomona's Blessing, Wings of Mariposa, and the absolutely amazing song, No Stars to Guide Me. Those quiet moments are still filled with like static and synths, and it just feels dark and haunting like a you know, post-metal album at times. Baseline, I think I could say like this band is like the evil doppelganger of the Deftones, and I think you would probably kind of understand that. There are barely any clean vocals on here. This is mostly just about percussive and very emotional heaviness, and it's just such a dark, gnarly, aggressive, but also very sullen beast of an album, and I absolutely love it. Like, every single song in here I thought was great, even the interludes kind of work in terms of like keeping the flow of the album. Again, it's debatable as to whether or not this band is a metal band, but I don't care. Like this is one of the heaviest albums I think I listened to this year and possibly one of the darkest. If you have not checked out this album, of course, I'm going to recommend it. If you're a big fan of, again, like Helmet, Deftones, but also like Neurosis and uh, Cult of Luna and stuff like that, check this out. This album is an absolute monster and will cave your head in with how heavy it is. So if any of that sounds good, Check this out. At number 21, we have Cloak, Black Flame Eternal. This is their third album overall, and honestly, I think it is their best album so far. I love their first two albums. I think they are absolutely awesome works of melodic black metal slash blackened death metal. It is really kind of a mix, but there is something about this album where just everything jumped out of you, the melodies, the dissonance. This album is just flat out packed with amazing riffs and, I mean, for those that don't know, I love riffy black metal. That is kind of my favorite style. Like, of course I love droning tremolos and, you know, all that atmosphere, but I need some riffs to kind of latch onto. And this packs riffs, groove, dynamics, 
There are great melodic hooks on virtually every song in here. Invictus is definitely one of my personal favorites as it is just a hyper aggressive track. Shadowlands is very anthemic in a way, but cold and dark. And the title track, which closes this off, is just absolutely epic. This band has been generating a buzz in the underground for a while, from what I gather, and I think this is probably the album that's going to break them out a little bit more to a wider audience, because I really can't think of anything that they did wrong on here at all. The production is absolutely perfect. The vibe is great. Like, this kind of has, like, a lot of dissection worship to it. But it also has a lot of death metal that kind of gets pulled in here to give it some extra heft in moments, and even some thrashy riffs occasionally. This album is just flat-out awesome, and I think one of the best black metal albums that came out, if you count this as just flat-out black metal, I would say it's debatable as to whether or not it's black metal or black and death metal, but it doesn't matter. It sounds evil, it sounds cold, and it is just absolutely epic as hell. If you're a big fan of Dissection in general, I would say definitely check this out. But baseline, if you just like very heavy, dark, sinister black metal slash black and death metal, check this out. Absolutely awesome album. At number 20, we have Werewolves, My Enemies Look and Sound Like Me. This band has a perfect discography in my mind, and that counts this one. I don't know if it's my favorite by them yet, but Jesus, is this band just absolutely savage. This band loves being heavy and fast almost as much as they love having a dark sense of humor about all of their work. This band includes the founding members of The Berserker and Dave Haley on drums from Psychroptic and a litany of other bands, and it could not be a more perfect combination of just blazing, fast, aggressive, but catchy riffs, Black metal, grindcore, and death metal all meeting up, all getting in a fight. Pretty much this band is Thunderdome with more chainsaws and probably rabid dingoes and venomous snakes all over the place too. Like it's that Australian and that out to get you. Every song in here is just absolutely vicious, not only in terms of the music, but even lyrically. Songs like the title track, Bring to Me the Kill, I Know Nothing Then and I Know Less Now. There's again, a lot of dark humor in here. Lots of savage grindcore sort of blast beats and down picking, but also black and tremolos mixed in there and just death metal aggression. Destroyer of Worlds kind of slows it down, gets a little bit more dissonant and more atmospheric, but it doesn't matter which direction they go or which style they decide to, you know, showcase more in a song. All of it is just some of the most heavy, intense music I think that has come out this year. I pretty much love this album for the same reasons I love all of their albums. It's just fast, aggressive, tighter than hell, and again, that dark sense of humor. It's hard not to love. I'm recently sure this album called me a grunt uh, once again. I can't say the C word because YouTube comes after me for that one. Apparently anytime I say that instantly I just get in trouble and we lose monetization. Oh well. Anyway, this album flat out rules, much like all their stuff. If you have not checked this one out, check this one out and then check out all their other stuff. And if you like fast death grind with black metal influences, you'll probably love it. So check it out. At number 19, we have Creeping Death, Boundless Domain. On their second full length, I think this band has pretty much got their formula down. These guys know how to blend hardcore and death metal into just this groovy, vicious sound. And this is their best work yet. I 100% I believe that. And what's really interesting is they got Adam D from Kill Switch Engage to do the production on here. And this is probably their heaviest sounding album yet. Kind of an interesting pick in terms of like producers, but absolutely nailed the sound. This is just loaded with punishing riff after riff. This thing is groovy, riffy, and vicious. Vitrified Earth is definitely one of my favorite tracks in here. Cursed Remnants of the Old Gods. Every song in here has catchy riffs, great like D beats, and just killer breakdowns. And man, the vocals on here are absolutely sick. Reese is a very underrated vocalist. Now granted, this band hasn't been around very long, but man, you hear him on this album, you hear him live, there's almost no difference. In fact, live he might be even more savage. Everything about this album fucking rolls, even though I do think the album cover kind of looks like an up-close shot of a corgi's butthole. I haven't been able to shake that since I looked at it, but you know, whatever. This album flat out rolls, honestly, I think it is their strongest effort so far. They pretty much just did everything they did well before, but just tighten it up. I think the riffs just stand out more. It's bigger, it's hookier, it's got corpse grinder on it. It's just great groovy old school death metal with a hardcore bite to it and everything on this album flat out rules. Again, if you're a big fan of just that 
groovy style of Texas death metal with a smidge of hardcore in it. Check this out. Absolutely monstrous album. At number 18, we have Static Abyss, Aborted from Reality. Chris Reifert has been a very busy man this year, not only doing another autopsy album, he also did one with Siege of Power as well, as well as this awesome project that he has with fellow autopsy member Greg Wilkinson. And man, is this just some of the most bleak, rotten death doom I think I heard this year. Every single death doom moment on here is absolutely just wallowing in misery. And that is large in part not only to Greg Wilkinson's bass work, but also the guitar work on here. All the harmonies are just flat out miserable, just droning and wailing, almost like moaning guitars. Like this album is just a giant bummer when it's slowed down and when it's sped up, it is punky, kind of thrashy, admittedly very similar to Autopsy, but I think it's the doom moments that kind of make it just a little bit more miserable. The production here is absolutely fantastic, which was also done by Greg Wilkinson and Chris Reifert on drums and vocals. I mean, the man is a legend. His over-the-top vocal performance just hammers in every bit of just miserable ugliness about this album. It's almost a theatrical performance and Chris is like one of my favorite death metal vocalists of all time just because he goes that extra mile to make everything sound so over the top. Especially on songs like Cathedral of Vomit, which is like such a big standout for me. It is just an absolutely miserable, gross song. Crosses and Coffins, Poisoned Limbs. This whole album is absolutely amazing. I didn't get a chance to go over the first one. Miller actually got to check out that one, but I did pick it up not long after I picked up this one and... Yeah, uh, Miller was right. That album's also awesome. Not surprised in the least. But I think this album might be a little bit better than the debut because it just feels like it's that much more rotten. Like it was just left to rot in a nasty run of humid days in a dumpster someplace. Like this album is just flat out filthy. If you're a big Autopsy fan, there's no reason why you wouldn't enjoy this. I mean, I imagine a lot of Autopsy fans also got this too. But if you just like slow, miserable, droning Death Doom riffs, and again, some of the most bleak guitar harmonies to go along with the riffs, I don't know where Chris is finding time for all these extra projects, but I'm so glad he is. Number 18, Static Abyss, absolutely killer album. At number 17, we have Suffocation, Hymns of the Apocrypha. I was anticipating the hell out of this album, and part of me was a little reserved just because this marks the beginning of a new era since Frank Mullen has decided to retire, and I wish him well. He's done so many legendary albums with this band. But this marks the beginning of the Ricky Myers era, and I think this era came out swinging. This is brutal, Technical, it is everything that I think you would want out of Suffocation. The riff work is intricate. There are killer breakdowns and huge slams, massive blast beats, and then Ricky is doing a great job on vocals. I mean, honestly, if you've been going to see Suffocation for years now, you've probably seen Ricky on stage just in place of Frank because Frank didn't tour that much. And I always thought he'd be the heir apparent just because he fit with the band. He had a good chemistry with them and he's got great stage presence. So it's really cool to hear him on a full album, and his vocals are excellent on here. He's just got a great, deep roar. Ricky's vocal delivery doesn't necessarily sound like Frank, but his cadences are very similar to Frank's, so there's this air of familiarity about this that I think a lot of Suffocation fans were kind of worried about, whether or not like Ricky would kind of change up things, but honestly, I figured he would just come in and just do what Suffocation does, because Suffocation still has a unique sound in death metal. They are still kind of the forerunners of brutal death metal, heavily inspiring tech death too. And once again, all that is on display in here. Uh, Dim Veil of Obscurity, Immortal Execrations, one of my favorite tracks on here. There's some great melodic hooks on Descendants. Embrace the Suffering is just absolutely savage. There really is not a weak track on here. This is Suffocation. Pretty much kind of just getting right back to it, getting kind of a fresh start in a way, and I think they came out swinging at the beginning of this new era. I sense that some people were kind of on the fence about this because we've been used to Frank for so long, but honestly, give it a chance. It is an awesome album. If you love Suffocation, then I can't imagine you not liking this album because it flat out sounds like Suffocation, as it should. So yeah, number 17, Suffocation. Welcome back, guys. Number 16, Judiciary, Flesh and Blood. This is 
Probably my favorite metallic hardcore album that came out this year. I was a big fan of Drain's new album and also Jesus Wept. But this one really stood out to me with its mix of just hardcore groove and breakdowns and amazing thrashy lead work. That combination on here, that and the raw emotion that you can feel in every song was the thing that kept me coming back on here. This album is just packed with riffs, grooves, killer breakdowns. I love the production on it because it's Arthur Risk and Arthur Risk just seems to produce nothing but awesome stuff here lately. There's an urgency and an intensity to every song. Like the first two songs are a great setup, great atmosphere, and then just punchy riff after punchy riff. But honestly, my favorites on here is the three song run of Knife in the Dirt, Stare into the Sun, and Cobalt. Those songs are just flat out heavier than hell and really catchy. Like, I love the more raw, hardcore vocals. There's really no vocals on here that kind of, like, dip into death metal or thrash metal in any way. They just sound like flat-out, old-school hardcore. But the riffs and the heavy syncopated chugs in here just drive these songs home. This is an absolutely awesome album. I was a big fan of their debut. I believe I saw them with Gate Creeper and Exhumed years ago, and they absolutely crushed it. And honestly, I think this band got even better on this one. Metallic Hardcore had an awesome year, and it's really good to hear a resurgence in that sound, and I think this band is definitely one of the leaders of the pack in terms of that new blood that's coming into that scene. And honestly, I feel like they got like the least amount of press out of like all the other Metallic Hardcore bands that have been coming out, like Drain and Jesus Wept. But this was one I just kept coming back to, and it kept getting better with every listen. So yeah, if you're a big fan of like old-school Metallic Hardcore, and you like you know, crossover thrash riffs and solos, but also like that Earth Crisis groove too. Check this out. This is an absolutely awesome album. Number 15, Black Braid 2. Obviously, this is the second album from this band, and this was one where, you know, there was a lot of hype around it, and generally the hype trains, I don't know, like sometimes they do live up to the hype. Often I find like, you know, like people oversell bands, this band lived up to the hype. I heard nothing but like great things about how like amazingly melodic and riffy, but still like very cold and just vicious they are. And all those descriptors were 100% right. So much so that not only when I ordered this, I ordered the first one too. And guess what? That one's also awesome. As I brought up before, I love riffy black metal and this is very riffy. As soon as you hear like the opening riffs on The Spirit Returns, like, that is just an instant hook right away. These songs don't overdo any particular dynamic. Like, there's lots of groovy pockets. Of course, there's blast beats and tremolos, but there's lots of just excellent riffs and melodies across the board. And versus the first one, this one definitely expands their sound as they lengthen out the songs and make them more dynamic overall. Moss Covered Bones on the Altar of the Moon was probably one of the big standouts for me. It's just a huge, lavish song and this interesting atmosphere that this album has that employs a lot of like Native American tropes because I mean the main guy behind it is Native American from the Adirondack Mountains. It's implemented very well and it's not overdone to the point where it takes over the album. Like you generally just get moments where you have like you know Native American percussion and some cool soundscapes in the background like crackling fire and then it goes into these songs and these songs are just super well written. And to further cement how badass this album was, it translates amazingly live. We saw them when they toured with uh, Garia and Wolves in the Throne Room and they might have been the best band on the bill. And that is no offense to the other bands that played because Gary had an amazing set and so did Wolves in the Throne Room, but this band just came out and whooped ass and it was just this absolutely emotional outpouring. The whole live set was just incredible and they played pretty much this entire album live. So pretty much as far as like hyped album, this is the exact opposite of Sleep Token. Whereas that hype train absolutely derailed and killed everyone on board, including my desire to ever listen to anything by that band again because oh my god that was awful. This album lived up to the hype. It delivered on everything that I like about black metal, and I am definitely a fan now. So yeah, if you possibly didn't jam this one just because you got tired of the hype train too, I understand, but I also say give this one a whirl because this is an absolutely awesome album. Number 15, Black Braid, killer stuff. At number 14, we got Dying Fetus, Make Them Beg for Death. This was one of my most anticipated death metal albums to come out this year, and I didn't get to review it because John and I were at Full Terror Assault, so Miller got the pleasure, and yeah, he raved about it, and when I got home and got it, I can see why, because 
I think this is one of Dying Fetus's tightest albums here lately. I thought the last one was pretty good, though I thought their songs were a little bit too long on that one for their style. This, everything is just tightened up down to the just most brutal, intricate, awesome riffs. And it's just Dying Fetus doing what Dying Fetus does exceptionally well. The only real change on here was the fact that John Gallagher has long hair now, which believe me, that is just still kind of weird to get used to because he's just been shaved bald with a goatee for as long as I've been listening to this band. But outside of that, this has everything that I love about Dying Fetus on it with absolutely excellent production on it. The band's formula of being as brutal as possible with hooks is just on display in here. Feast of Ashes might be a new favorite song of mine. That whole galloping triplet kind of thrashy section on there is an instant hook, but Throw Them in the Van and Unbridled Fury, oh my god, those songs are just brutal as hell, and there's a lot of cool old school touches to it. Like, it doesn't have just that dying feet of sound like there's some really cool d beat sections there's some actual solos on here which since whittling it down to a three piece they really haven't done a lot of solos if any like generally you get those really cool tapping sections that john does or just some flashy arpeggios and such but there are some like legit awesome solos in here that i really wasn't expecting because again it just hasn't been a thing for a while much like a lot of the old school death metal bands that all dropped albums this year this band delivered on everything that I wanted from them. And again, it was tightened up, it's riffy as hell, the songs are memorable and catchy, but they don't sacrifice an ounce of brutality. Uh, yeah, I love Dying Fetus, and this album, ah man, I don't know, could be a new favorite of mine. I've been a huge fan of Reign Supreme, but Destroy the Opposition is still kind of the goat for me. But I don't know, this album's kind of moving up the list for me a little bit. Yeah, uh, Dying Fetus absolutely rules. If you have not checked this out, you have missed out on some quality brutal death metal done by some true blue veterans in the scene. I think if you're a death metal fan in general, you should just check it out. But yeah, uh, pretty much Dying Fetus reigns supreme once again. At number 13, we have Cavalertech with Endling. I have been a fan of this band since their first album, which I probably also can't pronounce much like most of these songs because they're all Norwegian, so are all the lyrics. It doesn't stop me from singing along with these absolutely catchy songs. Um, I don't really know if this is a metal album. Uh, it has metal elements, like there's definitely elements of classic heavy metal, but there's a lot of hardcore classic rock. There's also like a ton of punk and some other stuff that is just kind of whirled up in this homogenized mix that is just kind of 100% them. Like, honestly, I can't think of another band that flat out sounds like Cavellertack. Like, this band can go from, like, stuff that sounds like Refuse to, like, classic Judas Priest and Iron Maiden, and then go into, like, full-on black metal a la Enslaved. Uh, they kind of do a little bit of everything in here, but the thing is, they do it all well, and these are just absolutely amazing songs. I was a huge fan of their last album, Split, which was a year-ender for me when that one dropped. And part of me, I don't know, I kind of like this one a little bit more because it feels a little bit more uniform and just a little bit hookier. Songs like Live Okay, I, I think I said that one right. They're repeated enough in the song where I think I'm at least close on that one. Great, like, classic Iron Maiden style riffs, but also just this ferocious punk attitude and some really excellent three guitar harmonies. Like, these guys make use of the fact that they have three guitarists in really clever ways where you get constantly layered melodies and just like sort of a unique approach to it where you have like acoustic guitars and banjos and then electric guitars kind of all whirled together. My personal favorite solo, probably the longer tracks, uh, Kavad, sorry, and uh, Morild. That one's a little bit easier. The songs are very dynamic and while they do like to switch around styles and approaches in terms of riff work, the whole thing has a very homogenized sound where everything is just blended together into this one thing that just sounds like them. And well, a good chunk of this has a good aggro bite to it, like it's very raucous and just kind of in your face. They have some great melodies in here. Svart September might be one of the catchiest songs they've written. Like that has like an almost Foo Fighters like hook to it, but played by a snarling Norwegian punk band. I don't know, this band's almost harder to describe than it is to pronounce their song titles, but I absolutely love this album. Debatably not a metal album, but I think it's heavy enough to the point where 
casual rock listeners are going to label it as metal because it's just, ooh, too intense. And, you know, the metalheads are going to be like, eh, you know what, it's got some classic, you know, kind of maidenly riffs, so eh, maybe we'll count it. Unless you're on the archives, which this band is on the archives. Either way, I strongly recommend checking out this album. It's just an absolute blast to listen to, and it's just rife with creativity and fun, and yeah, uh, that's just what Cavellar Tech does, so check it out. At number 12, we have Nothingness with Supraliminal. This has been one of my favorite new bands that I got into this year. This is just nasty old school death metal with kind of a loose, fun approach. The riffs are a lot of fun to listen to. There's like lots of weird, spacey, sort of cosmic atmosphere, but there's also sort of this lighthearted, self-aware kind of humor about it too. We actually got a chance to see these guys at Heavy Hell this year down in Indianapolis and we got a BS with the, the band and we got to talking about like, you know, just their style in general. And I was like, yeah, you guys have this kind of interesting vibe where it feels a little like loose at times. It's like, yeah, we just kind of like to have fun with it. Like, you know, I brought up the fact that Inviolate Viscera has what I would call the skeleton dance, you know, <laughs> sort of riff on it. Like that old cartoon where the skeletons are dancing. It's kind of close to that. And talking to them was like, yeah, we wanted to throw that in there because it was just sort of fun. And they even had that little rattle thing in there, too. I think I said, like, this album was kind of like Evil Dead 2 in a way, where it is definitely, you know, got all the gore and the grit that you look for in horror. But it also has, like, a air of silliness and it kind of makes fun of the tropes at the same time. And that is not to say that this band is not serious about their riffs and just bludgeoning breakdowns and twisted atmosphere and gnarly vocals. They are definitely serious about it, but they're having a lot of fun with it, and you can kind of hear it in the clever writing on here. There's lots of really strange, like, atonal riffs that pop up, big lumbering grooves, doomy sections, tons of blast beats, but it's all done with, like, just a weird sort of cleverness that you can kind of feel in this album. The big standouts in here, the opening track, Curse of Creation, is such a monster of a track. The breakdown at the end of horrendous incantation. Temple of Broken Swords is like a doomy bolt thrower song with incantation notes all over it. This album is just absolutely killer across the board and some of the most fun riff work I think I've heard in death metal this year. Like I said, for death metal this year, I think we had a banner year and large in part that was due to a lot of the old bands coming back and putting out quality material once again. But there were a lot of newer bands that came out with killer stuff. And this, I think, was one of the best ones that came out this year. This one almost flew under my radar. Uh, luckily, John reminded me of it, and we went over it. And I was like, yeah, I'm so glad we did this because this album is flat out awesome. Strongly recommend checking this out. Number 12, Nothingness. I'm already looking forward to new material from these guys. And go see these guys live. They put on an amazing show. And finally, at number 11, just outside of the top 10, we have Cattle Decapitation with Terracite. I love this album. Uh, initially, I wasn't sure if, you know, I thought this was better than Death Atlas, but now they're almost kind of on equal footing, and Death Atlas is one of my favorites by Cattle Decapitation. This album flat out rips. Every riff on here I think is absolutely killer. There really isn't a weak song on here. The breakdowns are amazing. The drum work is insane. Their blend of death metal and black metal is absolutely amazing. And it's only getting catchier with every album. And a good chunk of that is once again due to the insane vocal talents of Travis Ryan. I don't know how the hell he makes the noises that he makes. We just saw them live on their tour with Immolation, sang with Sugabog and Castrator. And him being able to do a vibrato with those goblin vocals still absolutely mystifies me. Now this band has been on a tear pretty much since Monolith in Humanity, I think. Like, they just have not missed. Even their earlier stuff, I mean, I'm still a big fan of Humanure that turned me on to the band. Well, I mean, that album cover definitely turned me on to the band, and then I kind of got into them a little bit after the album cover, because that was why I bought it. But it just seems like this band is just getting tighter and better, and being able to be as heavy as they are and generate the memorable hooks that they have has definitely become one of their strengths, namely Scourge of the Offspring. That chorus is absolutely catchier than hell. And lyrically, their disdain for humanity is absolutely amazing. It's quite poetic how much they dislike the human race. And believe me, I get it. You watch enough YouTube or the news or go out in public and go Christmas shopping. Yeah, no, you start hating humanity a lot. At any point in those scenarios, I could be chanting the refrain and the insignificance. Namely, the whole exterminate us bit because, well, yeah, no, we kind of suck. But yeah, this album is loaded with nothing but bangers. The Storm Upstairs, 
and the world will go on without you. Aphotic Doom, I absolutely love that one too. We Eat Our Young, yeah, absolutely crushing songs. And again, they're catchier than hell for being as brutal as they are. So yeah, I don't know if it's better than Death Atlas, but I mean, it's at least on the same footing. Either way, Cattle Decap killed it once again. Absolutely amazing album, number 11. If you have not checked this one out, you are missing out on, I think, one of their finest albums. So get to it. And that knocks out this section. And the next one up will be the top 10, my 10 favorite albums from this year. And believe me, those are going to be some fun ones to go over. So definitely stay tuned for that. And of course, if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you are new to the channel, subscribe because we do stuff like this all the time. We are also on Patreon. If you'd like to help us out there, there's a link down below to thrallsmetal.com. Our Patreon link is there. It is also on our channel, but thrallsmetal.com is where you go to find Thralls Metal stuff. We have new shirts. We have old shirts at a discounted price. We also have hats too. So if you're looking for any of that stuff, click the link down below. And of course, thank you guys so much once again for another awesome year of doing this. We are at five years. Uh, probably by the time you see this video, we will have hit the official five year mark since the day we shot our first video. Granted that video didn't premiere until like January of 2019, but we shot it in 2018 and yeah, Five years later, here we are still doing this, and it is mainly because of you guys. It has been an amazing run, and having all the fan support out there, you know, it's, it's just awesome. So I can't really thank you enough, and I might as well save some thank yous for the next video because I'm probably going to get even more thank you in that one because that will be capping off the year. So I'm going to keep this one a little bit shorter. Thank you all once again, and we will catch you later.